Good morning, everybody who happens to be on the other end. Um, just a minute or so from me, um, by way of context, um, Quake Centre has for a number of years now been uh, working on a small number of projects which are of specific interest to um, a number of our partners, particularly the hydro dam owners, um, and it relates to seismic performance of large earth structures, essentially put in its broadest terms. Um, and Kaylee and Jenny Haskell, at the time uh, when she was still here, uh, started that whole program with a piece of work which was actually going to be quite a small piece of work, we thought, uh, which was a, essentially a, a desktop study to try and understand what dam structures did we actually have in New Zealand. They weren't characterised, they weren't listed, there was no national dams database. And the first piece of work that those two very competent ladies did was actually sit down and create a New Zealand dams database. And suddenly, um, once people became aware of this, uh, our partners in particular, they took a great interest in it and then there was a greater interest taken more broadly um, by Envy and all sorts of other people. And this then spawned some follow-up work, which I guess to be fair, has you could say was a little bit outside of the context of what we originally planned, but still within the sphere of uh, work of interest um, from our funding partners. And so this is how we got to looking at aspects of stock banks, levies, and even more broadly again, in some geological studies that um, we've carried out, more or less all in the service still of understanding, better understanding of the ge geotechnical characteristics of some of our large earth important critical structures in New Zealand. That's why we're in it, basically. Is that right? Um, <laughs> Liam, did you want to add a couple of words or? Sure. Um... Yeah, I guess so following on from that, yeah, I guess this came about that I'd seen the um, Earth Dam's work and through the distributed infrastructure work was really keen to pull the similar sort of thing together with Stop Banks, who was sort of the, the forgotten distributed infrastructure network, let's say, but is certainly getting a lot more prominence. So really this was built of upon the back of all the work that was done in the earth dams and then translating through to um, collating a, a national stock bank data set for for New Zealand flood defence networks. And so I guess with the two of those together, that's really providing the ability to expand out into a much broader um, scope of work. So, yeah, uh, Kelly says I pushed her into it, but I'm certainly glad that I did. <laughs> all right, that's enough from me. <laughs> cool, thank you. Um, and today is actually a bit more of a story than a, a presentation at the moment. Um, what we found getting involved in the stop bank work is that it's actually quite different from the dam's work in a lot of ways. Um, so we'll get into that shortly. So today um, I'll be presenting the phase one outputs and really the business case for the stop bank work and why we're doing what we're doing. This is very, very, very much a collaborative approach. Um, as Robert said, I'm, I'm with the Quake Centre, that is my job. Um, my, I'm a geotechnical engineer, I'm not a geo, geospatial person at all. Um, so I'm teamed up with Professor Matthew Wilson at the Geospatial Research Institute. Um, and this project has been funded through um, Quake Centre and the Resilient National Challenge through Quake Core. So the funding is collaborative. Um, we have a master's student who Timmins was master's in early 2017 and unfortunately he's had a few health issues so he's um, going to be completing a little bit later this year. So that's Marcus Roger. And we're also tied into Liam's group up in Auckland and um, some of the work that his is doing. So this presentation isn't really about what I personally have been doing, it's very much a team approach and a, a good um, example of the collaboration that we have going on here. So a quick outline of today's talk. Um, firstly, flood protection in New Zealand, what is it? Um, where are we at and why are we here? Number two, um, toward an understanding of stop failure risk. So how are we actually gonna try and approach the problem that we're trying to solve? 
Um, the real meat and potatoes is the, uh, the outcomes of the draft New Zealand inventory of stock banks. So NCIS is the inventory of stock banks and then conclusions and future work. So flood protection in New Zealand. If you talk to me about protection against an extreme loading condition, I tend to think of a protective measure such as a helmet, and I tend to be a cyclist, so that's what goes on my head. I think about getting on my bike and trying to anticipate what kind of loading conditions I may encounter. And I'm hoping that I don't need my helmet. I'm hoping I do not need that protection. But if I do need that protection, I hope it works. So depending on what kind of bike I'm going to be doing, I might be in the downhill park, I might be on my downhill bike, I'm going to wear a full-size helmet. Comes with a little sticker inside saying it meets a certain type of standard. And as you can tell from the bag, I typically look after my helmet pretty well, so I think it's in the right condition. However, if I'm down at the park with my six-year-old nephew and I jump on his six-year-old nephew bike for a little spin around the park, more for a joke than anything else, I may not actually wear a helmet. And in that, in that case, I'm thinking about the loading. I'm not really expecting high-speed impact. Um, I might decide that the risk I'm going to take is pretty minimal. I don't need a helmet. Um, if I'm going down to the dairy, I might grab this one. It's pretty old, it's faded, condition isn't so great. I got given it from a friend in Canada, so it doesn't actually meet any New Zealand standard. There's no New Zealand standard or any standard inside this helmet. Um, and then similarly, if I'm on the road, I might look at something like this, which meets a standard, and I keep in pretty good condition. So for me, if I think about protection, I'm thinking about what loading am I expecting to encounter if, if something goes wrong? Um, and what are those protective properties in terms of the design or construction standard, how is it built, and also the current condition? Because as you can expect, if this has been booted around the garage for the last 10 or 15 years, it's not going to do the job that it was designed to do. As a society, we kind of expect that there are going to be broad standards that protect us. So if we get in a car, we put on our seatbelt, we expect that in a crash, a seatbelt will go some way towards protecting us. And there are certain kinds of standards across New Zealand and across the world that our measures of protection will meet. Okay. Um, and that's a similar thing with the helmet. If I buy a helmet, I expect that it meets a standard. As a society, we actually expect this at a much broader level. If we come into a building, we expect that the building is actually going to withstand what it was designed to do. So it's going to withstand loading conditions, it's going to be built to an adequate standard and it's going to be maintained in a way um, that means that it is fit for purpose for us. As we saw in the Christchurch earthquake, um, there are central organisations that actually administer these standards and if changes need to be made to improve public safety, the government can do that through way of um, regulations and the Earthquake Pro Building Act. This extends to large dams. We have dam safety guidelines. They're not regulations, but they are a, an acknowledged good state of practice for engineering of dams in New Zealand. Similarly, bridge manual, geotechnical guidelines. But what about stop banks? And how do we end up in a situation like Edgecombe in 2017? Clearly, the protective properties of that stop bank are not either not meeting design or construction standards or the condition isn't sufficient to withstand the loading in that situation. Um, the other interesting layer to this Edgecombe example is that it's not the first time this has happened. This happened in 2004, and, um, and nationwide there was kind of outrage at how this could be, how this could happen. And as a result, Ministry for the Environment, the central government got a lot of, um, there's a lot of lobbying from local councils and community groups and people around New Zealand, and said, look, central government, you guys need to do something to help guide our flood risk management. So they undertook a review um, with the steering committee um, and came up with all kinds of great nuggets that really, when you read them, are, qu are quite interesting, um, such as the physical and engineering attributes vary across the country depending on past decisions, community expectations, and the risk profile of each area. So if I buy a helmet, it meets the standard. But if I live in a community, there's actually no expectation at the central government level, that my stop protection will meet some kind of standard. 
Again, there are no uniform standards for the design, the construction, or the maintenance. Is my helmet new or have I kicked it around the garage? Um, for that flood protection. And so is it going to be in a condition where it can do its job? Something that really intrigued me was that central government does kind of have a role in flood response, but it's really about the response and the recovery, not about the protection, not about the planning, but in that actual ambulance at close, close style where central government will coordinate a response after an event happens. And this little gem, which I actually had heard before and thought it must have been paraphrased, but this is actually in the, in the document, was local flood risks are, are a local responsibility, which is quite intriguing to me. But it always hasn't been like this in flood protection. Um, and you don't need to worry about these diagrams in too much detail. There's just a couple of green bits that I'd like to point out. Prior to 1984, um, we had, actually in both of these cases, prior to 1984 and in the late 1980s, we had the Ministry of Works and Development. And the Ministry of Works and Development were responsible for civil projects throughout New Zealand. It was a really central core of knowledge, of expertise, of experience. What New Zealand had in terms of flood protection was a National Water and Soil Conservation Authority. And that was serviced through the Ministry of Works and Development. We had regional water catchment board, uh, water boards and catchment authorities, which were um, local groups that were um, authorities in, in the local region. So for catchment at risk, they would have a catchment board, but they would act through the National Water and Soil Conservation Authority, which is that central core for flood protection in New Zealand. The other great thing that the National Water and Soil Conservation Authority did was fund these projects throughout the country. And in some cases, uh, that funding was quite significant. However, <laughs> in the late 1980s and early 1990s, actually, the Minister of Works got scrapped. Um, the National Water and Soil Conservation Authority was also scrapped. Catchment boards were then integrated into regional councils, or so regional councils absorbed the responsibility of the catchment board. And instead, what we have now, in an approximate sense, from 1990 until today, the last 30 years, we have regional councils and unitary authorities that are responsible for our flood protection in New Zealand. And again, it comes down to that whole local risk or local responsibility. It's up to our regional councils to look after us. Um, they act based on the Resource Management Act, but essentially what they can do is limited by funding and limited by their own community demands, which is really interesting. And there are a whole lot of other associated um, programs from MCDEM and MFE. Are you and when you go and buy some stuff? Sorry? Continue. <laughs> okay, so if we're looking at local risk, what does it actually <laughs> mean? Um, understanding stop bank failure risk, failure under loading conditions. Since that decentralisation of um, flood risk management in New Zealand, we've had that loss of subsidy. So talking to one of the councils we're working with um, in this project, there's a bit of an anecdote about the locals at the moment are up in arms because they want improved flood protection. And, and our council contact is kind of like, ah, oh, you know. In 1985, we had the option of doing this. We could build the thing, government would fund um, seven eighths of the project. The local community only had to pay one eighth of the actual project, but at that point in 1985, it was too expensive. And now look where we are, because we have the local population up in arms wanting this flood scheme that we could have actually done back in 1985 um, with central government funding, but alas, we couldn't do it then. So we sure as heck have no chance of doing it now. So we've lost that core and that centralised government subsidy for improving our flood protection. In the last 30 years, we've also had that population increase of about 43%. So more people are living in the places that are protected by these structures. As people get older and retire, we're losing our core of engineering knowledge in the sense that the institutional knowledge within the Ministry of Works was first. Um, and, you know, the people that have been around and, and actually have that, that centralised knowledge of assets have retired or gone off and, and done other things. Um, and also a change in the state of practice. So what we know now is quite different from what they knew back in the... 50s, 60s, 70s, even the late 1800s when they were building the stock banks. Um, we have this fragmentation of expertise, resources and knowledge in New Zealand. 
And then, of course, we have the, the elephant in the room um, of climate change. So our, if we're thinking about the loading on our protection, we are increasing, uh, we're experiencing increasing flood loads as um, the climate changes. So what does this do to our risk profile for stopback structures? We've established that actually, if you visit my sister in Lower Hutt, who lives about a kilometre for a kilometre from a black stop bank in that image, you're not, you can't expect the same degree of protection or the same risk profile as visiting my brother in Pyro, who is also about a kilometre from the stop bank. We've established that at this point in time, there are actually no standards for these things. And society really is in no place to, to expect that at this point. If we think about risk in terms of your um, kind of conceptual hazard matrix, this is a very conceptual image. Um, you know, we have consequence on the top, which in our images is obscured by a pop-up. Um, so the consequence is what is going to be harmed if the stop bank fails against likelihood of that failure. So um, what is the likelihood of that stop bank failure and what is the consequence if it happens? Um, as we spoke about in a helmet analogy, that likelihood or probability of stop bank failure is going to depend on the loading that it experiences. The main loading condition for a stop bank, of course, is flood. Um, but the loading could also be seismic, it could be something else, it could be a debris flow. Um, and the real question is, is the other protective properties of our stop bank sufficient to withstand the expected loading conditions? Um, the protective properties of our stop bank really come down to design standards and they also come down to the asset condition. As it stands, as a nation, we really have no idea what the design standards and the condition of our stop banks are. So Lower Hutt and Pyro can't expect the same thing to happen, but what we can do if we can map the stop bank structures, we can, you know, through the, through the wider quake core work with um, Liam and Brendan and various other people involved in the quake core work, we can come up with a spatial model for expected size of loading. Similarly, uh, if we know the location of our stop banks, we can come up with a loading model for flood and we can predict the one in 10 year, one in 100 year events for these um, spatial locations. Um, and then with hazard maps and things like that, we might be able to predict additional loading from debris flows or other things going on in the area. Similarly, if we can locate our stop banks, we can look at, we can determine population at risk and potential loss of life. We can look at regional responses in terms of policy and planning and preparedness, and we can assess areas of value. So if we can locate these things, we can actually get quite a, quite a, um, make quite a bit of progress in terms of assessing what the risk for the area may be. But of course, the one thing we are actually quite interested in is what is our design standard for our protection? And what is the condition of that asset? So that's kind of the, the dream, is to understand that entire matrix there. So in this project, we're essentially hoping to begin to address um, the risk profile and begin to understand um, what the current status is. Even though we don't have uniform standards, we might be able to understand what the current status of our assets are. So the project objectives to produce a single standardized, reliability and spatially accurate um, inventory. So we're gonna pull everything together for New Zealand, collect all of the data, standardize it, and come up with a New Zealand inventory of stop banks. From that, we'll then be in a position to characterize the stop bank network. Hopefully learning about, you know, in addition to spatial properties, learning about the height, the type, the geometry, what kind of flow is it designed for? How much water can it handle? Um, and from that, and through collaborations with the Wider Quake Core um, projects and other researchers in New Zealand, um, NIWA and GNS, inform a first stage assessment of the hazard exposure of our stop bank network in New Zealand. The impacts, again, improve that understanding to enable these broad based um, screenings of consequence and performance. Ideally, we're trying to help the asset managers, the owners, and the public manage that risk of. Um, of the stop bank network, particularly following earthquake events. So what we've done to date, um, again, this is kind of preliminary data. The master's student is not at a point where he's um, confident in his data. So between um, Matt Wilson and I, we've, we've got the database and kind of run through some findings to, to show you today. So the New Zealand inventory of stop banks was facilitated through the Council River Managers Forum. 
So this would never have happened if we hadn't had that um, that buy-in from the regional councils, who are of course crying out for centralised guidance on what they do. So we met with the River Managers Forum and we received data from 13 of 16 regional and unitary authorities in New Zealand. For the remaining three, we were able to find data through um, Topper Map and, and various other um, spatial data sources. So we, we've got good coverage of New Zealand and 13 of the 16 regions have provided us their own data. Um, we've managed to catalog over 4,800 linear kilometer of Stop Bank in New Zealand, which is probably slightly more than we had anticipated. Um, the quality of the data and the attributes that were provided to us vary greatly from region to region. Um, the design and condition attributes are generally unknown. So we've asked for things like height, we've asked for things like design flood flow, and many regions actually don't know. A lot of them don't know what the embankments are made of. Many of them are still struggling to actually identify their embankments. Um, Funnily enough, which leads us to an unknown impact of the undocumented stop race in each region. Because, in particularly in rural areas, a farmer will build a stop bank to protect his cow or barn or some kind of asset. And in many cases, councils might not actually know about the stop banks. If we look at data completeness, um, Again, looking at those engineering properties to try and understand how well these structures protect us. Um, year built is known for just over 15%. So we actually don't really know across the nation how old these structures are. Um, previous work by a guy called Ericsson seemed to indicate that there were 2,500 kilometers built between 1940 and 1970. So that's kind of indicated that the stock was quite old. Um, we have heights for, again, less than 20% of the structures. We don't know very much about these things. Design flow is something I'd expected to be probably readily available, but again, we actually, less than 15% of our stop acts have an associated design flow. Um, and the primary material uh, is known for less than 5% of these stop acts in New Zealand. So that was a finding in itself, is actually the councils at the moment do not necessarily um, catalog or even know the properties of the structures. In saying that, we do have the spatial data, so we can use the location of the spot banks to determine loading characteristics and consequences. But again, those <coughs> resistance properties, the actual engineering properties, the condition and the standards are not that well known still. So this is an image that was provided to me by Matt, and I'm going to just break it down into pieces. Um, if we look at the national map, what we are looking at is a map of the 4,832 linear kilometres of Stop Lake New Zealand. And I need to check with Kerim and Brendan the exact source of the symbology. Um, but my understanding at the moment is that it's based on a national PGA model for the one and a hundred year event. So down in the left, right, bottom corner, um, you can see the, the key is peak ground acceleration expected for that one in a hundred year event. And we've gone from quite low expected peak ground acceleration in Northland. Um, and you can obviously see the, the traces of the Alp Alpine fault with the red, red values. The other thing for looking at this is our, our stop back network is spatially <laughs> distributed throughout New Zealand. Um, Every region has some kind of stop bank. There is no region that is completely um, unprotected by stop bank infrastructure, which is interesting to know. Um, if we look at stop banks by region, uh, this is a little bit meaningless in the sense that we're looking at stop bank length and area and not actually looking at populational risk in a way. Um, but we definitely see that the Nelson region has a really high density of stop banks. Um, we've begun looking at the risk, and for Nelson, I think 90% of the population live within a kilometre of stop bank. So for the Nelson region, you know, stop bank's a really big question about the reliability and the performance of these structures. Um, the other interesting, for me looking at this image, the other interesting one is Tasman, because Tasman is, has quite a large area. Um, fewer number of stop banks, but probably um, 
in the media a lot more about their, their flood risks, particularly after Gita and, um, and the locals are very, very involved in, in their own um, flood protection. So again, looking at stop length, length, um, looking purely at length, South London Police have the, the greatest length of stop bank um, and Nelson, again, not that many kilometre of stop bank, but protecting much of the, the actual area. Um, looking at the way the stop banks are distributed in terms of rivers, and the plot is a little bit again, meaningless without further interpretation. But what we are finding here is that a number of these rivers that have a large length of stop bank protecting um, people are associated with plains, as you would expect. So the Horoki Plain, um, first of Thames, that's the Waihau, the Piako, um, the Canary Plains are well represented in there, and also the Hibatonga Plains. So um, I'm from Hawke's Bay, so I look at that and I say, Tuki Tuki, Nauruho, um, Tutakuri, Waipawa, you know, the rivers that are protecting people um, in terms of stop distribution tend to be associated with, with plains, as we would expect. Um, we've begun to look at geology in terms of soil and rock class and the available geospatial layers. Uh, this is just a very broad brush approach based on GNS classification of rock class. And as we would expect in a river valley, most of these structures are built on classic sediment or sedimentary rock. There is um, um, minor contribution from the volcanics um, and future work is kind of looking at breaking the geology down a little bit more to understand um, what the stop banks are built on. And of course, given that most stop banks are built from local material, Inherently, you know, what is the topic built of? Given that we don't know that, we can infer through the geology. Um, so at the moment, we're at the point where we're, the analysis of the inventory is ongoing. Um, between Matt and I and students, we're going through a stage of QA and verification of the data to make sure that everything is as it should be before we can release it up to, back to the councils. Um, as I mentioned, the spatial hazard analysis is huge potential here to be looking at liquefaction maps, to be looking at landslide risks, to be looking at cascading hazards and how a flood event um, maybe may exacerbate um, risk in the context of other hazards in the area. One thing we are attempting to do at the moment, and this is just pulling up the horse bay example, is looking at um, liquefaction potential, so a model for liquefaction potential throughout the country, and that's something Aliyah has been working on, is a nationwide map for liquefaction potential. Here we're looking at a 1 in 25 year event for Hawke's Bay, and you can see the black lines of the stop banks. The beauty of this is that after an earthquake, um, this kind of broad-based screening tool might be able to inform us where we should be focusing our inspection efforts, and if we're expecting a flood immediately after an earthquake, we're going to be looking in the red zone to make sure that our stop banks are still in good condition. Even if they don't make design standards, we can actually go out and assess the condition and actually see what they look like in that event. So conclusions and future work. Um, again, it's, stop banks are a like pr protection in terms of the, a bit like a bike helmet. We expect that if we need them, they're going to be fit for purpose. Um, we expect that a stop bank or a helmet will withstand the predicted loading condition and not fail. <coughs> they can't protect us from everything. And, you know, there are going to be some events that actually, if we're hit by a meteor while riding our bike, a helmet's going to do nothing. Similarly, there are some flood events that a stop bank is never going to protect people from. Um, but there is a general societal expectation that there should be some kind of standard um, for society and um, prediction from, from flood events. Again, that probability of failure of a stop bank is going by the, the loading conditions through the flood, or the flood and the earthquake, or the flood and the landslide, um, and the protective properties of that, of that structure. Concerning stop banks, we're trying to work out if we can understand the design and construction standards in relation to that loading and the current condition of these things. This project didn't really get too far in terms of um, determining condition of the stop banks or even the design for structure standards. We're, we're making progress, but we don't have a heck of a lot of data in that sense. However, the spatial data alone 
gives us a lot of information in terms of the loading conditions and also the consequence and what these things are protecting. Restated, if we look at Lower Hutt and Pyroa, two areas that are protected by stop banks, given that we can map the stop banks spatially, we can understand the predicted loading conditions in terms of flood and seismic conditions. Um, we can look at the population, we can look at um, population at risk, areas of value, are there any cultural areas? So this project has managed to kind of tick off um, a number of these uh, kind of conceptual um, areas that we need to consider. The thing we're still working on here is actually understanding the engineering attributes of these things. So understanding the design, understanding the condition of our stop banks. So the New Zealand inventory of stop banks. 30 years after the decentralization of flood protection in New Zealand, this project aims to provide a national perspective on our flood protection levies in New Zealand. This is actually the first standardized national data set of stop banks that we've had. It's made possible entirely, really, through the support from the Council Managers Forum. So again, these are the regional and unitary councils that, um, that are embodying the, <laughs> the reality of the local risks are a local responsibility. These guys want to do the best they can, but they would like some more central guidance. So they've made this project possible to date. Um, we've managed to catalogue over 4,800 linear kilometre stop bank in New Zealand but we still don't know the engineering properties. Going ahead, uh, moving ahead, we are moving towards this nationwide hazard screening um, in collaboration with other groups, particularly the, the Quake Core groups and NIWA and GNS. Um, Marcus Roger should have his master's thesis hopefully done in June or July of this year, and that's a, a geospatial thesis, mainly looking at the um, the data structure and yeah, the, the geospatial science of putting together the inventory. And once we've done the QA and a little bit more of the analysis, we will be reporting back to the Council River Managers Forum for their input and, um, and comment on where we've got to date. One thing we do have going on this year, again, with support from Quake Core and Quake Centre and GRI, is another master's level project looking at um, how we assess the impacts of undocumented stop banks. So we've, we've got good buy-in from Tasman District Council, who are very concerned about the farmers up in the valley who built structures that may have a quite significant impact on their flood routing. So we are um, we're undertaking that master's project this year in 2018. And I think that's it. I got just run out of juice, so that is, I believe, the conclusion of the talk. And we're now open for questions. Great, Kelly. If I can jump in, Mishko here. Hi, Mishko. Uh, thank you for the really excellent overview. Uh, great work. Uh, I, I just have a, a few comments and would like to hear your opinion about uh, some of these issues that I will mention. Uh, great length of the, of the stop banks of nearly 5,000 kilometers and uh, very poor characterization, uh, characterization of uh, all of those uh, lengths. So in that situation, probably it's important to uh, make some classification based on the importance and exposure and risk associated with those. And suppose you focus on the 10% of those, 500 kilometers maybe, uh, where the consequences of failure are, are the greatest. And then you try to characterize those the, the best you can. Uh, and in that process, uh, understanding the materials and actually how the stop banks were constructed is really uh, critically important because that is going to probably tell you something about the uh, current state of those uh, stop banks. So the, the final comment about those uh, uh, liquefaction maps and, and combining those um, and to understand better interdependencies. Well, I understand that in a conceptual, uh, from a conceptual viewpoint, I believe those might be a bit premature. 
especially having in mind the accuracy of the liquefaction map itself and uh, the fact that you actually don't know what you are trying to assess uh, because of the very poor description of the uh, systems themselves. So how do you see you will be proceeding uh, in relation to the few issues that I have just mentioned? Yeah, and, and those are all issues that are, are, are really valid and, and things we've kind of discussed. The, the scope of this project um, was very much a, a one-year RFP through, through Quake Core um, and, you know, a, a small, small amount of funding. I personally have a lot of other things going on. <laughs> so if there's interest in, in taking the project, um, there's, there's obviously a lot of work to do. Um, and I, I completely agree with all of your comments. I think what we would plan to do now is actually go back to the, to the, um, to the river managers and, and work through the uncertainties. I am aware that there, now that we know where the stock banks are, there is potential to go and um, augment the database and you know, if we need to do, if there was an area that was a specific concern, we could do um, ground investigation, we could fly LIDAR to actually get heights of these things, we could um, potentially delve through non-digitised records to actually begin to tease out some of the engineering properties that may be documented but may not be collated. Um, I think the answer for you, Mishko, is I'm not too sure. There's a, there's a huge amount of work and we, um, I think we would rely on the, the river managers to, to provide guidance on their own priorities based on their understanding um, in the context of this national perspective that we're trying to provide. Um, but if there's funding and if there's interest in the work, then I think the main challenge right now will be working out a, a way to support the ongoing, the ongoing work in this, in this area. But thank, thank you very much for your, for your comments. Oh, thank you. Mark. Kelly, just um, following up, actually, I think um, going towards what Mishka was coming at in his second comment about um, the use of, uh, sort of hazard maps, one thing that uh, was very striking after the Kaikoura earthquake in Blenheim was the stock banks were damaged in very specific <laughs> locations where there were paleo channels um, and where there was a where the old river crossed of course. Um, yeah. the uh, stop line. So actually, it seems to me that you've got a scale problem here in the sense that these liquefaction maps are uh, trying to cover on a broad brush kind of way yeah. um, hazards, where essentially it's sort of the details which are important um, <laughs> to determine where you might actually have problems. So I guess um, I wondered whether you started to make a sort of a uh, second database of uh, cataloging failures um, of stock banks, which then obviously gets linked back into the other details of the main database, which should help you see where the problem is. Yeah, be. and this is something that's a great parallel with, with dam engineering, um, where, I, where I actually belong, I don't really belong in stuff, but in dam engineering. And actually, you know, the broad-based failure mode stuff is sometimes helpful, but if we look at a, a recent, um, catalog of, of dam failures. It's actually the, the little unique things that aren't picked up at the broad level that are actually causing dam failures. And it's, you know, the foundation level five or six or eight meters below the dam that fails, not what they think is going to happen. So it's, it's actually those subtle things. And in some cases, a number of subtle things that line up like, to actually cause the failure. So definitely aware of that. Um, that the, the failure database is Again, something that um, through the New Zealand Society and Large Dams is a huge um, demand to begin looking at that. Um, and I think the beauty of New Zealand is people don't seem to be that um, afraid to provide information, which is brilliant, um, not the case in North America. So in the dam sense, um, been involved in a, a few international discussions around putting together a dam incident database and definitely with the stop banks. That seems like a you know, it's such a powerful way of spatially understanding, um, at least an empirical level, where we may expect failures. Do you, would you like some work to do, Mark? <laughs> 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 no, no, I mean, I mean, if we're looking at scale, it's, it's like, I'm going to flip that back to everybody in the room and say, um, 
you know, is this triggering kind of any interest in, in what you're doing? And are you saying, actually, I'm really interested in looking at something in a bit more detail and doing the liquefaction maps or putting together um, a set of field observations that may help inform our interpretation at the, at the national level? Kaylee, I think yes. I would actually take the opposite view. Um, I think, okay. I, I, think I, I disagree that we should we should ignore those maps. I think those maps are actually important because we know, I guess a lot of people on this call know, and we understand that those are probably vastly overestimating the area we might yep. expect damage. But you've got a national data set where you can show based on current sort of planning information, this is what we think is going on. And if we sort of show there's a huge area, what we can actually say, well, actually based on some of the case history evidence, it's shown that really the scale as Mark said is important. So this becomes yep. actually quite a powerful tool to link our lack of knowledge in that area linking it to, you know, maybe people think more about flood impact. So it actually may motivate to be able to improve our knowledge for both. So I think yeah. that's a good first step to do that broad scale, broad scale mapping to then inform to say, well, actually we need to learn a bit more to actually get a better improvement of that. Yeah, and I think it's, it's in parallel, you know, you, you do your broad based value modes and analysis and that's helpful, um, but it's just this understanding that you can't be completely blind based on, um, you know, broad-based risk assessments we actually need to, to delve a little bit deeper in terms of the scale. So, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to imply that they weren't useful. Um, if, you know, after Hawke's Bay, if there's an earthquake in Hawke's Bay, we're going to be able to look at that map and say, where are, we, where are our concerns at a very, very basic level? It's, it's much better than nothing. Yeah, if I can add, uh, I, I definitely agree that they should be used, but it's very easy to misuse those kind of maps. And yeah. they, they provide a false sense of accuracy sometimes, and they can provide also a false sense of security. And I always try to see what we as engineers can contribute. And we understand that there are specific issues and problems that really create 90% of the, of the hazard and exposure. And uh, we are trying to identify those and then mitigate. So we will address most of the hazard issues. If that kind of understanding is, is prevalent in the regional councils, they would know that those kind of maps are just the initial step, and that will be the proper use of those maps. I believe that we as engineers who should present and clearly state those views and processes so that they can follow and help us in that process. Uh, otherwise, it's easy to stop with those maps and think that, yes, we have covered that, we know what's going on, which is not the case. So I believe that sending that kind of message and, and information about the process and the importance of it is really uh, something that uh, should be a, a follow-on from these kind of studies. Thanks, Michiko. And one thing I, I try and avoid in the dam space is, um, you know, conducting a broad-based failure mode analysis. And then some dam owners will go and um, invest all their money in installing in instrumentation to pick up on the identified broad-based value modes. And actually, they become blind to the, to the wider picture and they're not investing in um, instrumentation for other eventualities because they're only focused on the outcomes of a broad-based, you know, is the dam going to overtop? Is the dam going to fail in a certain way? Therefore, we're going to invest all of our time and effort in um, picking up these value modes when actually you've got to understand that a broad-based value mode assessment is never going to pick up all of your... Um, all of your actual potential risks. So that that blindness, you know, taking preliminary data and becoming blind to other eventualities is definitely something, and particularly in the dance space, that makes me a little bit nervous. Yeah. Um, I wondered, uh, are you talking about should the sort of completeness of data across the top end network? And if you sort of zoned in on the regions which are probably the most important to understand, uh, like Mishka said, where, where it's important to protect the biggest number of people, perhaps. You started with, you know, a zoomed in approach on that. I wondered whether you'd probably find all those lie aligned within or close to cities and are um, council owned assets. I wondered if, if that's the case, whether within any particular region, you could then start looking at um, the year built as sort of a proxy for construction methods of the time. And 
then so year built becomes perhaps one of the on that basis it might be one of the most important bits of information and i wondered actually um new zealand seems to have a really good collection of historic photos yes and whether actually um, that might be a really good approach of trying to look through those to get even just in the ballpark. Absolutely. And one thing we've been doing with the dams is going to New Zealand archives. And if you haven't been to New Zealand archives in Wellington, it is amazing. Um, it's an upscale library where the people are there to serve you. And I am just astounded by the amount of detail that they actually hold for structures that were built by Mystery Works back in the day. Um, so again, as I was saying, now that we know where these things are, there are options for going for collecting information. Your other comment about the year of construction kind of being a proxy for um, engineering standard is a really valid point. And that's, again, something we're finding with the dams, is that if we know they were built in the 1930s, we might be looking at a puddle core, but then, you know, later on, we began to understand that puddle cores weren't really good, so we stopped building them. So that kind of construction methods and assertive practice when they were building the things is going to be hugely important to us today. Get on. Anything else? Um, feel free to get in touch with Liam if um, <laughs> if you'd like to know more. <laughs> I'm good at making people do interesting stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as you can tell, yeah, it's, it's a really, really interesting project. And I've learned a ton um, from interacting with the councils and kind of empathizing with their situation or sympathizing with the situation and that they're trying really hard to do good things, but they're in a really tough spot. So the more we can actually do to help them understand the central um, perspective and, and work toward, I wouldn't say pressuring, but aiding the central government to, to actually um, enforce some kind of standard, that would be really helpful. We're a long way away, but really excited to be helping them out if we can. Thank you. Thanks, Kaylee. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Liam.